so today's presentation uh, is uh, from the, the HEALS Consortia, which is both the newest and the largest of the three European consortia. Uh, it's uh, being led jointly by uh, Dennis Zeragianis at uh, Aristotle University in Thessaloniki, Greece, uh, and Isabella Anessi Maizana uh, at uh, the University of Pierre and Marie Curie uh, in Paris. Um, we were hoping to be able to tag team um, present this with the, the two leaders today, uh, but as, as uh, most of you will know, today is Bastille Day, and Isabella is actually stuck in a, a Parisian traffic jam with all of the festivities that are going on. Uh, so we're hoping that we'll be able to tie her in at the end of the presentation, uh, but if not, uh, we'll, we'll have Dennis present the whole thing. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to the more interesting part, which is the presentation uh, on the consortia, and Dennis, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, David, and uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, and indeed, congratulations for this initiative. I think NHS is really taking the lead in uh, something that's really um, worth, uh, the, you know, uh, spending time and uh, effort on, and that is to internationalize uh, the collaboration on uh, not just uh, building better exposure science, but actually really overhauling the whole uh, concept of uh, exposure analysis for uh, improved uh, risk assessment and in this sense uh, unravel the expo zone. Um, so what you see is um, the, um, the logo of the Hills project, as uh, um, David mentioned, uh, Hills is, a, is the third project funded by the European Commission on uh, the expo zone. There's a couple of them uh, which were funded one year ahead of time for, with regard to Hills and uh, will be presented in the next few uh, webinars, I think starting from next week. Um, what is the difference between Hills and, and the, the other two projects is that uh, even the, first, the, the, other, the, the other two projects, Helix and Exposomics, were essentially trying to uh, build to uh, indeed decipher the exosome as a concept and try to uh, make it make some sort of examples of how it can be used. Hills was designed to uh, use the exosome, so it's uh, to, to take the exosome from a more, a more mature phase, if you like and um, try to see how it can be used operationally for improved risk assessment and for providing information to the European Commission and the other and the member states in the, Euro in the European Union, all the 28 now member states, uh, on how to uh, build Europe-wide uh, exposure and health examination surveys. Uh, and that is why, as you see in the title, uh, what we're looking at is actually trying to build on the health and environment-wide uh, associations using as a major tool large population surveys, indeed, uh, in order to uh, unravel uh, the exposome. Uh, as David said, it's led by uh, me and uh, Isabella, uh, and uh, Isabella excuses herself because, as she said, she's, let's put it like this, she's a victim of the French Revolution <laughs> of sorts. Um, so uh, let's start with uh, uh, the presentation. What we see as the current state of play uh, with regard to the um, situation in terms of environment and health associations, is that uh, we have, um, we, what we see is actually a series of silos, um, so three different communities looking at uh, the toxicological community, the clinical one, and the epidemiological community, looking at different types of uh, concepts with regard to uh, both uh, uh, the questions of exposure, the question of dose, and the question of uh, evaluation of outcome. Um, so, and these three communities actually do not necessarily talk to each other as much as I would like them to do so. Uh, so the real question is how we can combine information from the different disciplines to compose an integrative methodology, one that actually uh, makes treasure of uh, the, the, the different types of uh, data and uh, information value that can come from, the different, from these three um, communities, disciplines, where the exosome stands among all of that and uh, how can it be used in this sense, and what are the tools that we need to actually uh, be able to integrate the, the information that's coming from uh, the tox analysis, uh, the epi analysis, and of course by clinical data. Uh, in this regard, what we are trying to look at is of course uh, the Hills paradigm is actually uh, taken uh, uh, on board the adverse outcome pathway uh, concepts, trying to link exposure to community level effects of course, uh, but then what is the traditional case uh, so far is to actually move from uh, community uh, from community effects and move into more individualized type effects. That's exactly what the exposome is about, trying to look at the individual exposure and 
making individual effects, um, but then also to look at uh, uh, organ system effects, sort of systemic effects in, in, the, organ, in the human organism, uh, and of course organ specific effects. Uh, and that is what is uh, traditionally been provided primarily by uh, sort of toxicological types of analysis. Now to do that, what we're looking at uh, in, in TLS is a lot of uh, uh, going into uh, linking, linking the external to the internal dose. And uh, what you see is actually an example, a graphical example of a PBBK uh, type model, a sort of models that take into account uh, biokinetics of uh, xenobiotics uh, in uh, the human body, uh, taking into account physiology. Uh, and also metabolic properties, and linking these to the uh, different types of effects from the organ to the system to the individual and eventually to population level effects. How to do that now uh, in HILS? Uh, we're actually not just doing a classical mathematical, if you like, uh, association, statistical association, but instead we try to follow a more uh, <coughs> biologically informed approach, if you like. So we're combining uh, different types of omics. Uh, data sets from gene expression to uh, proteomics analysis using, of course, bioinformatics to uh, actual uh, metabolomics and eventually uh, identifying cellular effects and, and, and tissue effects that then we can combine with the uh, actual impact on uh, different types of organs, which will then link to uh, what you see uh, in the right of, of the picture. Uh, so what we're trying to do is to combine, to move into a more mechanistic kind of uh, appreciation of the links between exposure and effects. Um, do that at the individual level first, and then uh, actually allow us to uh, build this into population level uh, impacts and therefore identify the actual adverse outcome pathways for the population. Again, uh, the main thrust of HILS is not just to capture exposure per, uh, correctly in an exosomic type uh, approach, but actually to uh, tell inform the uh, decision makers how uh, one can actually use this uh, improved exposure assessment for better health effect assessment and eventually population risk assessment. Um, so, oops, that was fast, too fast. So what is the actual um, methodology? What we're trying to do is to uh, use the uh, GWAS, genome-wide assessment uh, approach, and also the EWAS, environment-wide associations, uh, couple them uh, in a, uh, as you see, in, a, in an integrated and complex scheme, which uh, actually takes into account, uh, and, um, and, you know, a multitude of environmental exposures, uh, capturing the epigenomic uh, type effects, uh, and, and then, of course, the interaction with uh, uh, genetic variability and susceptibility. Uh, primarily uh, shown by uh, uh, SNPs, uh, and actually uh, move on into the whole um, array of different types of omics, from the transcriptomics to proteomics to metabolomics, to actually integrate them into creating causal associations between uh, exposure, environmental exposure, and uh, effect. So it is important to highlight that we're talking about disease etiology, as opposed to simply uh, a statistical association. Um, and then, uh, at the same time, the, the, kind of, the, kind, the, the type of study that we follow actually um, to relate environmental exposure to phenotypes of uh, uh, adverse health outcomes is a combined longitudinal cohort study. It's actually, we're building um, a diff two different, you will see uh, later on that we're building into two different types of health population studies um, uh, in terms of uh, using, on the one hand, pre-existing data sets from create this in cohorts and at the same time uh, building a new birth cohort uh, with an oversampling on, of the twins and that is to try to capture uh, better uh, the epigenetic effects. Um, so the idea is for you to, to focus on this uh, birth, uh, on this uh, cohort uh, uh, type studies and integrate into these, nest into these, a case control study uh, which would actually allow us to provide uh, better mechanistic uh, confirmation of uh, the kind of causal association that we're trying to uh, unravel. Uh, <clears throat> so as I said, the whole idea is to actually uh, link along, uh, along the sort of continuum of the different types of omics from uh, uh, gene expression uh, uh, modulation to protein co coding change and then eventually to metabolite profiling uh, differentiation. And in this, so we're actually looking at identifying specific pathways identified by transcriptomics analysis on messenger RNA, 
um, linking this to and verifying with PAFU is verified by metabolomics analysis, doing a joint uh, bioinformatic uh, uh, assessment of the, of the different types of uh, pathways identified uh, through these two levels of pathway analysis and identify uh, adaptive stress responses and eventually um, adverse outcome uh, responses uh, phenotypes. Now, as I said before, uh, we're building this onto two different types of population studies. Um, on, uh, we have said that uh, we're going to be as inclusive as possible or if you like as agnostic as unbiased as possible with regard to environmental exposures. Uh, but at the same time, we need somewhere to start from. So where we started from is actually the health outcomes. So we focus on three major types of health outcomes, allergy and asthma, uh, and indeed the major links with particulate matter and biologicals, uh, neurotoxicological uh, problems, uh, things like neurodevelopmental and neurodegenerative disorders, and the links with uh, metals and metalloids and also uh, pesticides, for instance, and endocrine disruptors, uh, and of course obesity and childhood diabetes type 2, and the obvious link with the endocrine disruptors. Uh, this is, again, the whole point here is not to identify, not to, not to say that we're going to uh, work and study, you know, one outcome compared to one type of chemical, for instance, or the genobiotic, but actually when I say link with endocrine disruptors here, for instance, in the, in the obesity uh, bullet, I mean that uh, the main focus will, of course, be on endocrine disruptors, but we have already identified, for instance, that there are joint path, common pathways that link endocrine disrupting chemicals with both obesity and, uh, and induction of childhood diabetes type 2, and, for instance, uh, in pre-inflammatory um, um, states, which can be eventually linked to um, respiratory, uh, to allergic asthma, for instance. Uh, so there is a, obviously cross linkages uh, across the health outcome spectrum that is, uh, that is to be covered by, by HEALS. Um, on purpose, we did not uh, tackle uh, cancer in, in HEALS because, uh, again, at least one of, I think both of the other two uh, exosome projects, European exosome projects, do work on, on, on cancer outcomes. Therefore, we felt it would be, um, you know, spending, uh, overspending money from the European citizen to uh, do a third study on, on cancer with the same type of uh, configuration. Uh, in addition to the using existing cohort data, and now we're talking about, uh, when I'm saying existing cohort data, I'm talking actually about large numbers of uh, both data and biosamples from biobanks from previous studies. Um, we are uh, starting, and we have already, uh, now we're about to finish the, the design, and we're now uh, starting the recruitment of uh, the excess study, a pilot on uh, European, or, of a European exposure and health examination survey. Uh, that's a, 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 if you want a, a family longitudinal and nested case control study, so it includes the mother, the father, and the children uh, of uh, families with newborns. This includes two phases. One, the phase one, which actually is the longitudinal study, uh, including um, 10 countries in Europe, uh, in, within which uh, for in, uh, there will be 200 twins uh, and uh, matched by 200 singletons and uh, 500 unselected singletons and their parents who will be recruited during uh, the next 18 months and will be followed up for three years um, in, until the end of the project. And of course, we're, we're planning to continue the follow-up uh, time after the five-year overall period of the project. Um, and then phase two, and that's a nested, a nested case control with uh, 140 twins out of the 200, um, 70 singletons and 100 mothers and fathers. Uh, with, a particular, as I said, particular of a sampling on twins, what we're going to do in the, in the phase two sub-cohort, if you like, the nested case control uh, design, we're, we're going to do the full uh, array of technologies that, we'll, that I will show to you in the next slides that will be employed, deployed in, uh, in HEALS, uh, from uh, the full array of omics to uh, a really a very complete and thorough characterization of exposure with personal sensors, individualized sensors, uh, data fusion of uh, environmental uh, data, um, and so on and so forth. As uh, you see in the last bullet here, in the start bullet here, uh, ethnic minorities will be included in the, in the study and will actually be targeted to the extent possible. Um, so the, this was a specific request to the European Commission that, uh, to take a look at that, and indeed we have a specific 
um, work back as it is linked to uh, socioeconomic status and uh, issues that pertain to ethnic minorities, both with regard to exposure and with regard eventually to uh, genetic or epigenetic variability, for instance, and how these would actually affect uh, the, continue, the linkage between exposure and uh, adverse uh, health outcomes. Uh, in the next slide, you see a, you know, my, my and Isabella's Bible, I guess, that's the, uh, in a graphic form, that's the actual workflow of the whole project. Uh, uh, as you see, six streams of activity um, moving from uh, uh, setting the scientific and policy context and the methodological framework. Uh, to the internal and uh, external exposome, both with regard to analytical techniques and what we call here analytical exposure biology, and that includes biomonitoring, chemical and biochemical biomonitoring, and uh, omics, um, to computational exposure biology that includes the PUPK modeling and internal dosimetry modeling, uh, and uh, also and metabolic profiling together with uh, advanced bioinformatics. Um, that this is being coupled to, to the actual external exposome, estimating the external exposure to multiple health stressors. Um, these uh, work packages actually include work that relates, that pertains to bringing in information from uh, pre-existing um, European-wide, Europe-wide or uh, national or regional environmental monitoring systems uh, and databases to actual personal sensing uh, equipment to uh, satellite. Uh, sensing and, and actually being able to fuse all this information in WP11 uh, and trying to indeed integrate them into a, a coherent uh, exposure uh, profile prof um, system uh, across Europe. Um, the idea is to link these data sets, the methodological framework, the internal exposome uh, data, I mean uh, tools, and the external exposome tools into the uh, into stream four. That's where the actual associations with uh, between exposure and health effects which are going to take place. And this includes the uh, data management part. So if you want the uh, IT infrastructure um, to be able to actually uh, manage the overall system and then the actual, if you want more methodological, more biostatistical and uh, uh, mod health effect modeling uh, part that is the WP13, work package 13, uh, and the envi environment wide association studies. All of these tools, uh, so and after stream four, we're in the realm of uh, tool development, if you like, methodological development. All of these are going to be applied in stream five in population studies. On the one hand, on data and samples um, that exist there, uh, that exist from pre-existing cohorts. Uh, so actually, we uh, we have already started this month to analyze our first samples uh, with omics analysis. I'm going to talk, talk, talk to you about that later, and then um, to actually then. Uh, use the lessons from uh, analyze, making the first this preliminary analysis on pre-existing data to the uh, pilot uh, exposure and health examination survey, uh, the excess study, or in our internal jargon, the new birth cohort. Um, clearly, there is significant importance to uh, given to the project for to, uh, to dissemination, training, and uh, knowledge transfer. Um, indeed, participation in this webinar series uh, is part of that, and uh, we're very happy that this really can be done early on in, in the project. We're now in month nine of the project of a 16-month uh, long uh, project, actually. Uh, let's talk, let's take then one step at a time. Let's look at the internal exposure, what we mean here. So this is the list of uh, omics platforms that uh, are going to be uh, put to bear uh, in um, the context of HEALS. And that includes, uh, as I said before, a number of uh, omics uh, technologies. Uh, you uh, started from transcriptomics, uh, messenger RNA analysis, on human data primarily, and also on in vitro uh, data and samples for mechanistic hypothesis uh, anchoring primarily. Uh, so it's more for confirmatory um, um, analysis on, on specific uh, hypothesis on uh, toxicity pathways. Um, this will be coupled to metabolomics. Uh, here we actually bring to bear a number of uh, different types of technologies from NMR to uh, advanced uh, uh, liquid chromatography MS and MSMS uh, tandem systems to GCMS. Uh, tackling a number of uh, xenobiotics from metals, dioxins, phthalates, PCBs, and PAHs to give an example. 
Um, we will actually uh, move on to apply uh, adectomics on uh, both oxidation uh, of oxidation and alkylation induced damage, um, both with regard to uh, DNA and in particular to specific proteins like albumin, for instance, and hemoglobin, and uh, also use specific types of uh, functional assays to act to indeed um, again uh, be able to confirm specific uh, path pathways of toxicity hypotheses. Um, as I said before, we're also going to be looking at the genetic variability and therefore we're going to be doing SNP profiling and uh, functional analysis of repair proteins. Uh, again, to try to understand uh, the linkage with uh, how uh, with uh, differentiation in, in DNA. And of course, uh, epigenetic analysis using essentially primarily looking at methylation profiling um, in order to actually identify differences between epigenetically influenced and independent uh, SNPs. Uh, so that is in, in one slide if you want a, a very large bunch of uh, chunk of work um, with regard to the internal exosome um, experimental analysis if you want. And uh, that's how all this comes together. That's the exposure biology workflow in HILS. So we would start with an, unbi an unbiased uh, whole genome messenger RNA expression analysis using microarray technology and at the same time, on the same samples, do untargeted metabolite profiling, uh, as I said, using uh, either uh, LC-MSMS or msms stuff for NMR. Uh, the idea is then to uh, combine this with uh, bioinformatics tools to do actual pathway analysis, on the one hand to molecular uh, pathways and then to metabolic pathways that uh, can be identified statistically as the most important ones based on the actual, again, agnostic, unbiased, characterization of the uh, specific samples, on the one hand from the, from the molecular side, on the other from the metabolite side, and then combine these two into a fi find, if you like, which pathways are common or come closer to uh, linking the molecular pathways identified as, as most likely and the metabolic ones um, through pathways, of, through actually um, the uh, development of specific hypotheses on uh, pathways of toxicity. And that would be okay, but uh, we actually need to be able to confirm that and link not just to hypotheses of pathways of toxicity, but actually confirm that this is true uh, in the real population samples we have. So here we're going to tackle them, uh, couple them to targeted analysis. And here, as you see, we're now moving into more targeted, on the one hand, metabolomics, on the other, also targeted DNA and methylation analysis, targeted proteomics for indeed confirming the specific hypotheses. Uh, that relate essentially to uh, micro uh, to messenger RNA uh, expression modulation, and then of course to targeted functional assays to link to uh, the final uh, phenotypes and endotypes that would actually uh, provide us provide to us the corroboration that the, our toxicity pathways um, hypotheses are actually correct or they need to be dropped. So that is essentially in in one slide again. Uh, the timeline on, of the workflow in terms of uh, the exposure biology analysis and, and, and sort of bioinformatics that uh, is going to be is right now being put in, in, in use uh, to use in, in, uh, in hills. Uh, today, as, we, as we're talking, we are starting with uh, uh, the first two uh, steps, so the whole the unbiased uh, mRNA and uh, metabolite profiling. And uh, we hope that within the next, uh, we have started with the first uh, 300 samples from uh, uh, our first cohort from Poland. Um, and uh, we hope that within the next couple of months we should have the first results of the pathway analysis that relates to these specific uh, um, analytical uh, techniques, if you want, to then move on to the more targeted approach uh, and therefore the uh, phenotypic and endotype, endotypic uh, anchoring. Um, now, we're, as I said, we're, we're going to be using uh, different types of technologies. Uh, what I show here is what we're using in, uh, in uh, my university, but actually we're going to be using uh, much more. We're using mostly agilent uh, type technologies in, in this case. Uh, so we're combining the LCMS and GCMS uh, type tools to um, react using the mass center uh, analysis and putting all the information to the GeneSpring platform. Uh, to actually do the pathway, uh, to identify specific biological pathways uh, aligned to the reference to reference uh, genome and therefore um, being able to identify uh, 
which are the most important and uh, if you want genetically important uh, pathways that uh, relate to the specific uh, analyzes that are going to be found in, in our samples. Um, now, to do that, you need to actually be able to uh, bridge across different types of uh, omics techniques. And uh, what we're doing is we're actually using pathway mapping across the different types of omics, as I said before. Uh, and that, that, includes, uh, that includes information uh, on uh, specific identifiers in omics data, uh, both uh, gene, protein, and metabolite ID, um, doing uh, with uh, identifiers from a number of uh, as you see, state-of-the-art uh, uh, worldwide databases uh, on both metabolite, protein, and gene uh, identifiers. And then, uh, then be able to map these identifiers from the databases to the actual pathway, uh, pathways that are induced, so as to actually show to us easily how um, the different types of uh, responses we, we see at the, uh, the genetic and also the, metabol the metabolite and also the proton uh, type responses actually map together, come together in a cohesive continuum, and therefore can be part of the of the same toxicity uh, pathway. Um, at the same time, as I said, we're going to be looking at the number of epigenetic uh, markers. As you know, uh, when we're talking about epigenetics, we can see, we expect to see different types of markers from DNA methylation. Uh, so methyl marks added to uh, DNA bases that actually repress mm -hmm. gene transcription and therefore um, actually change the type of, uh, of, of response one would expect uh, in the unmethylated uh, transcription. Um, we're talking also about histone modifications, the combination of different types of uh, molecules that can alter uh, the activity of DNA, uh, which is wrapped around uh, the histones. And then, of course, microRNA analysis, uh, essentially is look, looking for uh, non-coding RNA that blocks translation of mRNA into proteins, or changes the actual continuum bit from uh, uh, the transcriptome to uh, the proteome. Uh, what we will be looking at primarily in, uh, in HEALS is, DNA, is the methylation part. Uh, it's more a question of uh, having, if you like, standing a, a higher chance of uh, seeing uh, actual effects. Uh, with regard to our continuum, because what we're really interested in is to actually capture uh, the uh, what we know what we call disease programming through life, and that's not just through uh, the, the, the the fetal period, uh, so in utero or through in utero exposure, but actually looking at before conception, and therefore looking at parental epigenome, and how this how this is being translated into the epigenome at birth. Uh, through early life exposure and how, and therefore how this affects the epigenome during childhood, and then of course later life exposure and how this affects the adult and indeed the uh, aging epigenome. Um, so we are really talking about uh, trying to identify uh, the combination of different levels of epigenetic uh, 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 situations. Uh, that's that, that of course is uh, uh, by a uh, paper by uh, Fleiss and uh, Wright and Baccarelli from 2012 but actually shows very nicely what exactly we're trying to, uh, to do in, in HILS. Again, the power of the project is indeed lies with the large population cohort data that um, are participating in the project and of course the full array of, of uh, um, analytical capabilities and modeling that uh, and bioinformatics that comes uh, into play. Uh, at the same time, we're looking at uh, not just at what's happening at the, at the genetic and epigenetic level, uh, but also, as I said before, at the meta metabolome. And indeed, we need to be able to, con to, con to uh, link uh, these metab metabolomic uh, changes to actual external exposure changes, right? So that's, that's the whole point of uh, using, of talking about the exposome. Uh, so we need to be able to uh, create, uh, the, to reconstruct, if you like, the internal exposure. So this, uh, uh, one big chunk of work has to do with the development of a generic and validation, actually, of a generic uh, live course PVVK model, uh, so indeed a, a model of biokinetics of genobiotics uh, taking into account uh, human physiology and actually human physiological change uh, across uh, the life continuum, across the lifetime. So with, with our model actually takes into account lifetime evolving parameters like uh, volumes of different types of key organs, blood flow change, uh, age-dependent uh, difference in uh, 
depending on age, uh, so in, in clearance rates and metabolic capacity, but also takes into account in uterine exposure, therefore takes into account the mother, the interaction with the mother and the fetus. What you see right now on the screen is indeed the, the coupled mother-fetus model. So it takes into account uh, in, in transplacental um, transport of xenobiotics, but also uh, lactation and breastfeeding as a key uh, mechanism for, on the one hand, detoxification for the mother and to some extent <laughs> intoxication of the child, or at least burdening of the child, uh, especially when we're talking about persistent, uh, about contamination of, pers of persistent organic uh, pollutants, for instance. Um, so this is an important part of uh, our array of tools that are going to be put there. Uh, we already have developed the model. We're now in the process of uh, validating with a number, uh, and indeed ex expanding the chemical space that it covers so as to be able to indeed put it to, to use in an agnostic um, chemical uh, discovery mode, if you want. Um, now, one, one interesting part that relates to the exposome is actually trying to take stock and, and benefit from the large arrays of biomarker data that currently are being, um, being developed and coming together from starting from the U.S. in Haines and the National Children's Study uh, to Japan, uh, but also indeed to Europe with the COFAS and Democophis and a number of uh, <coughs> national studies, the Garrett study, the uh, FLESH study in, uh, in Flanders, the German, uh, German studies and so on and so forth, France, Holland, uh, all have a number of uh, uh, large biomonitoring studies which actually have provided already a number of uh, a large chunk of, uh, of data. The problem is what do you do with the data if you don't have all the exposure data that needs to come with them to be able to use the, bio the biomarker data to relate to exposure and therefore uh, uh, essentially affect, uh, I mean linked to, to actual exposure levels. So what we're trying to do is to actually a, a devise exposure reconstruction uh, methodologies in HILS to benefit from the uh, um, biomarker data, data that we already have. And that's the kind of uh, um, methodological scheme that we are now being developing. So starting from the biomarker data and uh, some exposure-related ancillary data, some things like time activity diaries or dietary patterns, for instance, or some environmental contamination information that, in, in by, by and large, actually uh, exists in a number of countries across Europe and the world, I might add. We can actually then plug them into an exposure model, create a, a first potential exposure estimation, and then run the PVPK model using a, a, a Monte Carlo uh, sampling of the actual exposures, run the model, you know, n times, um, large number of times, compute the actual biomarker uh, values, for instance, <coughs> levels of the, the genobiotic or uh, its uh, metabolites in urine or uh, in, the, in, in, in blood, and compare with the actual biomarker databases. That will actually, uh, this process will actually reject a number of uh, model simulations, therefore, indeed, leave us with a, a, a specific uh, distribution of exposure values that can be consistent with the biomarker data. But, it can, but as such, in terms of process, it cannot assure us that this kind of exposure uh, profile, and actually the one that you see on the right here, um, in this, on the right part of the slide, actually is the one that relates to the uh, exposure uh, profile that uh, is correct, so that is the, the, the actual one that gave rise to the real biomarker data, the ones, the ones which are measured. So what we do then as the next step is to actually couple this type of analysis with an optimization algorithm. Here we use actually a genetic uh, algorithm for optimization uh, to improve the sampling process, go back to the Monte Carlo, indeed run again the PVPK model a, number, a large number of times, reconstruct the biomarker uh, uh, profile, and then recheck with biomarker data, reject a number of model simulations, and move on, and actually eventually converge to what is the real potential exposure estimation, that is this kind of graph here, which mathematically can be shown that it is the actual optimal uh, distribution that, that fits the observed, measured by, by monitoring values that we, see, that we show here on the right. So this kind of scheme actually will allow us uh, to, uh, to infer, if you like, the most, the, the, most uh, the, the, the exposure profile that fits the closest to the actual biomonitoring data 
in the, in the lack of uh, good enough exposure information. And I think that's a very important methodological development uh, in HEALS as in, in the context of actually being able to reconstruct the exosome because obviously, especially when we're talking about persistent compounds, it is very difficult to indeed capture late, uh, early life exposures if you don't capture it from the beginning. Uh, but it is uh, obviously very uh, I mean, more uh, easy, easier to actually uh, measure uh, biomarker values. Uh, with this algorithm, you can actually reconstruct the, the, the exposure profile over time uh, based on the actual biomarker data. Um, the next step has to do, of course, to being able to, to discover patterns in the data both the uh, biomarker data and the omics data we're talking about. So here we're talking about, uh, indeed, clustering uh, algorithms for uh, bioinformatics. Um, and uh, this is a classic scheme of actually bioinformatics analysis we're going to be following uh, in order to be able to, indeed, identify which are uh, the, the best new bi novel biomarkers that predict, in this case, on the one hand exposure, on the other effect, um, depending on the kind of data set that we're going to be using uh, for in, in our analysis. Um, let's talk about that. So that's for the internal exosome with regard to technological developments. Let's look at the external exosome because that's equally important. Uh, <clears throat> so what we're doing right now, uh, what we're doing in HILS is to actually try to pull together uh, the, the uh, large, I think, uh, volumes of data that ha are being measured across Europe on, envir envir <coughs> sorry, on environmental contamination. And therefore, we have built a uh, software that actually uh, goes and um, essentially uh, taps onto the databases that exist at the European level from the European Environment Agency to national databases to even local and regional databases in different member states for a number of uh, classes of uh, pollutants, different types of countries as you see, uh, different types of stresses within each class and of course subcategories. Uh, and uh, actually be able to do a search on, on the different types of data sets and therefore reconstruct the overall levels of exposure. You can actually move and zoom in. That's the case of Greece, since I'm calling you from, uh, from Greece. Uh, and that's actually, you can get information on the specific station uh, in which you, you monitor the, the kind of data set you're using, uh, what type of data, what type of uh, value, what type of period and therefore have all the metadata analysis, uh, metadata that uh, can support your further anal analysis. So first step is, is to actually retrieve existing, pre-existing Europe-wide data on environmental monitoring so as not to reinvent the wheel and indeed pull in information that is uh, important for exosome analysis. But the next step is to actually advance, enhance our exposure uh, assessment capabilities and that includes, um, I think, three major um, novelties, innovations. One is trying to capture uh, what we call an, an individual space-time activity model uh, and I'm going to dwell into that in the next slide. The second is to actually be able to um, improve our um, exposure analysis through personalized sensors and again we're going to be talking more in detail about that. So as you see the sensors are actually linked to <coughs> both uh, type of activity type, but also types of environmental and also even biochemical contamination. What you see on the left is a glucose dot that actually captures uh, uh, glucose levels in, in blood on an iPhone. And uh, then couple all this information, use all this information for, to, to allow us to uh, extrapolate the individualized information that we obtain through uh, on the, 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 the fusion of environment-wide exposure data sets and personalized, personalized exposure data, data sets to uh, uh, more population-based exposure metrics through not just uh, pure statistics, but actually <coughs> more sophisticated agent-based modeling tools, which actually allow us to take into account the fact that uh, people do interact among each other, uh, with each other, and uh, their, these interactions also take, into, take stock of uh, fluctuations, if you like, of exposure. Uh, um, fields. So let's look at this in, in detail. Uh, what's the individual space-time activity model? Here, uh, that's a, a concept of essentially a time geography, if you like, uh, and that the idea is that exposure can be viewed as the summation of uh, travel through a number of hazard fields in space and time, and um, 
it is important to, for us to be able to, and if we're talking about long exposure, and, the expo and that's, the, that's what the exposome is about uh, at the individual level, uh, then it is important for us to understand uh, that um, actually how human, acti human activity uh, during the interaction with the hazard field uh, helps move our assessment from exposure to likely actual individual personal life goes. And uh, in this sense, this time geography method methodology provides a, a good ontological framework to explore the behavior between the spatial and temporal uh, attributes of exposure for, in for individuals. Uh, and by essentially creating these hazard vectors, what you see on the right of your screen, um, you can actually analyze and model the trajectories and therefore determine an individual behavior in terms of uh, this space-time um, <coughs> assessment. So what essentially it means is that, you know, uh, if you're born in a, in a specific city, uh, in, in a country, in Europe, you go maybe move to a different neighborhood, at some t uh, time in your uh, early life, then you move to a different city, and there you go. You you work, let's say, in a, you you live in an area that is uh, um, in industrialized zone. Therefore, you're, for instance, exposed to a higher level of, of hazard. You spend some time there. You go to university, then you move abroad. You come to the U.S. or, <laughs> or somewhere else. Um, spend some time. Move to for your masters. Move to do a PhD. You move on. You move to into a different now kind of setting. Uh, for instance, you work in the chemical industry, you move in a different type of hazard prism, and so on and so forth. In the end, what you end up with is a hazard vector, as you see, which essentially captures uh, your, um, in, let's say, translates how you move over in space and time with regard to the actual uh, hazard profile that you accumulate in your, in your lifetime. And you can do this in a space and time continuum, and that's important. That's the interesting part in this kind of analysis. Um, then the idea is to actually be able to extrapolate uh, this information to the population level. Uh, for, in, for in this sense, we use agent-based models. Uh, here we use um, agent-based models are uh, modeling style where individuals and their interaction with each other and their environment are explicitly represented. Uh, so you can attach exposures to locations like I showed before. And as an agent passes through space, they will do different types of activities and, expo and accumulate a number of uh, types of exposure. So what's important here is to devise that the rules for the agents uh, allow which agent families can interact with each other, uh, rules that can actually be dynamic. For instance, as the child ages, as an individual ages from childhood to adulthood uh, and uh, later life, uh, these rules can actually change. We eat different things, we move differently, we do less or more sport and so on. And of course we need to derive exposures for different types of uh, location, locations and activities using the data from uh, sensor studies or from local air pollution sensors or from satellites, as I said before. In terms of the sensor studies, we're be, right now we're, we're, we're starting this month with a pre-pilot uh, pre study on um, a small number of sensors right now uh, in terms of both tracking, different types of activities, uh, and uh, so these are, these are just examples of what we're, we're uh, contemplating, uh, looking at Adults, sensors, but also at, uh, at uh, baby, uh, adapted sensors to actually allow us to take into account uh, information on uh, respiration, skin temperature, body position, and activity level of, of infants. Uh, but also other types of sensors uh, that actually capture environmental exposures uh, together with uh, location. And combine, combining these different types of sensors in the same sort of uh, primarily smartphone-based uh, type uh, uh, platforms. The idea is that we would actually be able to data fuse and uh, reproduce uh, exposure profiles that can, we can, can be attributed to the specific uh, types of activity, uh, intensity, and location. Um, the idea then is to, uh, uh, to complete the methodological journey, if you like. <laughs> and of course, once you have the external and internal exosome to, associ to, com to uh, uh, associate them to uh, health effects here, the idea is to actually use a number of uh, more advanced techniques, looking at, at uh, directed acidic graphs or Bayesian inference techniques, to actually not just take into account uh, classical epidemiolog epidemiological association models, but actually, uh, and therefore uh, correct or confounded, but actually take into account uh, multivariable uh, and multivariate types of associations in order to uh, take stock of how different types of interactions of uh, stressors uh, can actually affect 
uh, our um, overall individual uh, exosome. Um, <clears throat> now, I, I, what I, I think would be interesting is to, to show you uh, a small example, if you like, of uh, applying this approach, just so, so as not to keep it, uh, you know, uh, only theoretical. Uh, and uh, that's an example based on, on work that we have done uh, in, in, in my lab. Um, essentially, previous years, sort of putting it together, uh, following the HEALS paradigm. So this is an example on co-exposure co to our famous uh, quaternary uh, VOC mixture of uh, benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene, BDX. Um, and um, this actually was a study that was done in a, in a, in a town, with well, a number of cities actually in Europe. I'm going to show you examples from a city in, in Greece, uh, Ioannina, where we actually put uh, this, you know, used a number of sensors, from personal sensors to environmental sensors to uh, couple them to environmental modeling tools, and, and even to artificial intelligence techniques to actually uh, enhance our capability to model and fuse exposure data, um, plug them into uh, the PVPK to actually taking the, into account uh, metabolism and indeed estimate internal dose, apply the internal dose levels to uh, the different types of omics that I mentioned before, and then uh, try to assess based on these levels at the organ level and eventually even the uh, actual individual and community level in terms of uh, measure in terms of individual and population risk. Uh, so what, that's the example of, uh, that's the result, sorry. That's the result of the data fusion of uh, exposure data in Ioannina. It's a very nice city in the north of Greece, uh, uh, next to, uh, to a very nice uh, mountain lake. Um, but the, the thing is, you have actually very significant variability in exposure levels to uh, uh, BDX in this case, uh, and you see how this uh, inter, inter, you know, intercalates. Uh, in this case, I'm, I'm just showing the, the benzene part, but it is actually the same similar thing for the for the full uh, BDX make sure, uh, depending on the type of activity that uh, people um, are doing uh, primarily in the, in the day. Uh, so, uh, be that uh, commuting, uh, staying outdoors, or actually spending more time indoors. Um, so, this is the example of a combination of environmental and personal sensing. Then we use this, these levels to actually, we plug them into the PVVK, we estimate the internal dose that this uh, pertain to, and then <coughs> actually analyze at the same time transcriptomics uh, um, uh, data samples, in this sense, um, for two different types of mixtures, uh, which we, we identified in this study. Uh, mixture A, what you see on the, on the left side here, mixture A and, and mixture B. So mixture A is the, uh, a mixture of BTX, which actually is uh, more, benzene, more, rich, more rich in benzene. It has about 20% by volume of benzene. And uh, mixture B is, is what we call the benzene core. Um, <clears throat> make sure that has much more toluene and only 10% of, uh, of benzene. So um, what you so um, this is what you so um, what you so okay. And so what you see is the the types of um, in this case number of genes and which are related to the specific metabolic uh, molecular uh, pathways which have been induced primarily by acute exposure to the two types of mixtures, you see differences, of course, uh, and you see indeed that mixture B actually has, so the toluene richer uh, mixture has specific um, levels of, uh, of effect of inducing, if you, if you like, these types of uh, metabolic, of um, molecular pathways that relate primarily to protein metabolism, uh, transcrip transcription proper processes, and eventually signal transduction, and then Look at how the picture changes with, the, with chronic exposure. First of all, here we, do, we start following a more a normal uh, dose response curve where the higher levels actually show the higher uh, response, where, whereas it was reversed in the acute uh, situation. And uh, indeed, the, the types of, uh, as you see, the types of uh, uh, pathways that are now being induced, the processes that are being induced actually uh, are different uh, and indeed uh, of a different of a different quality, if you want quality to be different than the ones after, after acute exposure. So now we're talking more about protein metabolism, biosynthesis, uh, but also uh, hematopoietic type um, uh, processes. So the same, now what you see here is actually a, a pathway analysis comparison between mixture A and mixture B, 
Uh, here we're looking for specific genes or a sequence of genes, which can be biomarkers of uh, exposure or even or effects in this case uh, of the particular uh, mixtures. Um, so this is after this is the uh, shorter uh, time period and the longer time period of exposure. Uh, what you see is that you have actual uh, for apoptosis that's the apoptosis signaling pathway, and you see that mixture B, the toluene enricher uh, pathway uh, mixture, is the one that actually induces, as we see. Uh, preferentially, the uh, highest, uh, the, the, to, to, the, to the largest extent, the actual uh, apoptosis signaling pathway, but only after a longer term uh, exposure. Now, that's, these are our results. And now, in 2014, this is actually, these results were uh, out uh, a couple of years ago, two, three years ago. Uh, and th in 2014, another group uh, from uh, San Zhang and uh, Yin and Fu uh, actually identified a variation in endogenous metabolites in bone marrow cells and plasma uh, in mice exposed to benzene. As you see, there are actual a number of metabolites which are related to similar types of pathways to the ones we saw with the gene expression data, um, protein synthesis and uh, hematopoiesis, for instance, uh, or um, fatty acid metabolism, which actually have been seen, as I said before, with a molecular pathway. Uh, analysis of the, uh, the messenger RNA level. So here is the example of what I was saying before, the joint pathway analysis. Now this is not joint because we did not do the, the metabolic analysis, but uh, now we're doing it in the new samples. But that's an example of how these kind of data sets can actually be put together and therefore show us the way of what could be plausible, putative um, pathways of toxicity. Uh, now one key problem here is that <laughs> this whole Analysis assumes that uh, we are actually, uh, you know, uh, pristine type of uh, we have, uh, individuals with uh, pristine types of livers. That's not true. We don't. Our liver does not metabolize as uh, well as it would have been had, had we been really uh, un, I mean, completely detoxified normally. So you need to take into account to do a very, com you know, correct uh, analysis of this type of data. Uh, the extracellular perturbations of metabolic states. Here what we're doing is we're actually using dynamic flux balance analysis to couple um, biomarker identification uh, data from, uh, gene, from gene expression data in, uh, t with regard to particular uh, metabolic processes to actual change in the, in the flux distribution of uh, the xenobiotics and their metabolites at a cellular scale. And we do this in an, in, in an uh, iterative mode, uh, so whereby we assume a first, if you like, metabolic rate from tissue concentration, use them as an upper bound for a flex balance analysis, estimate uh, the flex distribution, taking, taking stock of change in, in uh, metabolic capacity from genetic uh, data, and then use this uh, <coughs> flex balance analysis calculated uptake as the upstream metabolic rate, simulate with the PVPK, the whole body concentrations, and then move on to reiterate and therefore estimate what is the actual uh, change in, in, in metabolic capacity over time after being exposed for a number of days to the specific types of uh, type of uh, toxicant. That's the kind of uh, <coughs> result obtained from the uh, gene expression data. Now this is now is the previous one was untargeted. This is actually targeted on uh, cytochrome P450, the major um, metabolic process pathway for uh, BTX, and uh, you do see that you have a specific uh, differentiation in uh, uh, the specific parts of CYP450 uh, uh, based on exposure to BTX to different, to different types of mixtures after uh, short and longer time uh, times of exposure. Uh, this kind of differentiation actually then is translated into PBBK uh, change, and that is the, the estimation now for uh, the actual concentration of uh, benzene, in this case metabolites, in bone marrow um, after exposure to the different types of the, the two mixtures, the benzene rich and the, and the toluene rich one, A and B, respectively, uh, to benzene only and to and the, and the benzene exposure. So what you see in the normal, in, this is these are the, the actual data from the uh, CD that I mentioned before. Uh, that's the benzene exposure of, uh, of a number of individuals over two days. Uh, this is the actual exposure uh, of the metabolites if, they, if, if these individuals were exposed only to benzene, but actually they're exposed to BDX. So this is 
after exposure to Bdx in mixture A, so richer to with benzene, and after exposure to Bdx with uh, uh, more toluene. Um, so you do see some differences, which are not very significant quantitatively, but if you like qualitatively. But that's a, but the, and that that's for a non-occupational type exposure. Now, if the person actually is a, is an individual who again the, the, these are people in the real um, population group that we actually analyzed. If this individual then is working uh, with uh, particular solvents using uh, benzene, for instance, or in uh, gas stations, actually you do get a, a higher uh, level of uh, occupational exposure in this case, but also a more important difference in the um, metabolites of benzene and gone marrow um, when uh, the person is actually co-exposed to the full mixture, either be that uh, more rich to ben with benzene or to uh, with toluene. So as you see, we, we just doing this kind of more thorough analysis, you can actually identify specific differences in the uh, overall exposure to the co, uh, or rather co-exposure to the full mixture uh, of what that we're studying in this case. And as I said before, that was a pre-exposome type study, but it's the same type of concept. So we're only looking at BTX. Um, and if you actually take into account and convert this into population risk, you can actually estimate uh, num uh, different types of uh, risk estimates for the general population, for uh, particular areas of the city, uh, and then of course for specific uh, professional categories, uh, which again in this case gas station uh, employees for instance. Uh, which as you see there is enough variability to account for the differences in both the exposure and the actual capacity uh, of, the, uh, of the individuals to metabolize, in this case benzene, um, in the long run. Uh, so it is taking into account the external exposome with regard to the BTX uh, uh, mixture and the internal exposome with regard to its, po its uh, potential metabolites uh, in converting them into actual risk uh, metric. Um, so I think I'm running out of time, but that's I think the last slide. So in, in, in a nutshell, what are we doing in HILS? Um, we're trying to move the state of the art um, in a number of, uh, number of fronts. On the one hand, I'm actually being able to integrate, uh, to have an integrated use of existing environmental and biomonitoring data. And that, I think, is crucial because if indeed we, we can uh, uh, succeed in doing that, we, we open, uh, I think, the, the, the way to uh, a widespread use of the exosome concept because both in the U.S., in Japan, in uh, Europe, a large number of both environmental and biomonitoring data are right now becoming uh, widely available. What is not available yet is the possibility to uh, integrate and interpret the data uh, in a joint fashion, and that is what we're trying to strive to uh, uh, achieve in HILS. Um, improve assessment of the external exosome with environmental data fusion and agent-based modeling, with indeed a number of uh, sensors and sensor webs, uh, including uh, fusion of satellite data for a number of, uh, in particular, um, atmospheric pollutant uh, stressors like PM, like NO2, like ozone, um, linking external to internal exosome um, by integrating the use of omics and chemical biomarker data and taking into account the temporal dimension. Again, as I said before, the question of uh, being able to capture the, the change in metabolic capacity uh, with age, but also with uh, uh, the level of, toxic, of intoxication of the body, uh, or if you like, or the burden of the body, with the previous uh, type of, uh, types of exposure. So advance the tools for environmental and biological data analysis through uh, improved internal dose estimation and exposure construction using PVDK modeling, but also coupling these models with uh, uh, gene regulatory uh, models and therefore allowing us to quantify uh, what or to the um, information that we obtain with uh, pathway analysis using omics data to actual uh, metabolic uh, information based on physiology uh, to actually identify novel bio, bio, bioinformatic strategies for biomarker prediction and uh, essentially focusing on meta-modeling for biomarker fusion and therefore allowing us to pull in information on, on a number of uh, types of uh, biological markers and indeed um, uh, improve for the science of environment-wide association studies. On the, one hand, on the one hand, looking at uh, the use of advanced statistical tools uh, like directed uh, cyclic uh, graphs, but also data and inference models, 
and also using concepts that I did not mention in detail here um, about which we actually would borrow from uh, <coughs> genetic analysis like linkage disequilibrium to actually allow us to discern causal associations and not just associations of the different types of biomarker data. Uh, finally, the whole point is to uh, actually use the, uh, to enhance what is known as enviromics, if you like, uh, the study of the wide array of environmental factors in relation to health and biology uh, and make this into a uh, reality for use in public health and, and risk assessment. Um, in, this case, in this sense, I'd like to actually acknowledge, since I mentioned linkage, linkage disequilibrium, that uh, as well as the work of a good colleague uh, who I think now is in Harvard, he used to do it in Stanford, by uh, Shirak Patel, who actually, uh, in my view, was a pioneer in this, and um, I think, he, you know, you're very happy, you're very happy in the U.S. to have him among you very closely. Um, that's it for, for me. Thank you.